Hello. Good morning, Blender Conference. I hope, um, I hope you're all awake. This is day three, so all of our brains are melting. I hope you have plenty of coffee. I'm running on about six right now, so I think it's going to be a good talk. I'm pumped. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying uh, thank you to everyone for being here for today to hear the talk, and also everybody that's watching online, and uh, most importantly, the Blender Foundation. You guys are amazing. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you for an amazing piece of software and an amazing conference. It's been really, really, really great to be here. Thank you for the invitation to speak. My name is Chris Bailey. Uh, I run a YouTube channel, do lots of crazy stuff. But what we're going to talk about today is uh, short filmmaking, what it is, how to do it. We're going to talk about sequences, which sequences are like short films inside bigger films. And that's what I do for my living, is I make sequences. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really exciting tool, Blender, to be using to make sequences. And um, I'm pumped because we're going to talk about first a big overview of sort of camera work. How do, you, how do you make cameras tell a sequence, tell a story in a sequence in a really efficient, really effective way? We're going to just kind of do sort of a big overview of that. And then we're going to dive in and we're going to talk specifically about um, a way of using Blender to make short films or to make sequences in larger films that I personally find incredibly exciting because it's non-destructive and it's non-linear. And I don't think anybody's actually mentioned it or talked about it yet, so I'm pretty pumped. I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you'll have some aha moments that you can take away from. So um, like I said, I, I run a, uh, a YouTube channel with lots of videos. Please go watch them. Like and subscribe. Do all that stuff. Um, here's a little uh, trailer for the, the channel. So we can have the lights dimmed, and I'll, I'll play this. This has audio, so you can get a taste. Hello, and welcome to another exciting Blender tutorial. I'm loving it. <laughs> so there you go. No shortage of uh... thank you very much. No shortage of ego there. Tutorials that will blow your mind. Um, th this channel came out of a desire to make cinematic stuff and break it down for people, make it really simple, um, and try to teach the process of making cinematic shots and sequences using Blender. So it's really what the channel's been about. I also started doing stuff with CG Cookie a few years ago, so you may have seen some of my work with them. Um, and then out of YouTube, um, I got the opportunity a few years ago to begin working with Animal Logic. Animal Logic's a really amazing film studio in Sydney, Australia, where I live. Uh, they've been making movies for a very, very long time and uh, amazing pedigree of stuff. But they started using Blender, which was very exciting. And so they invited me to partner with them to begin to develop their their Blender experience. They helped bring them into the world of Blender. And uh, it's been an absolute privilege to, to do that for me. Um, very exciting. So what I do at Animal is I am a pre artist. So I am helping their team get used to Blender, figure out how to use it. And also then I'm working a small team on a brand new feature film, a very exciting, very big movie that I can't talk about at all. Um, and I'm doing pre in that film. And what is pre -vis? pre -vis is short filmmaking. It's basically taking a bunch of toys, so the assets the art department has been making and putting together the sets and the characters and things, and you get the script, right? And you, and you go and you say, okay, you know, Chris, you're doing this bit. This is your sequence. And so you take this, this section of the script. Sometimes you've got some storyboards to work off of, maybe a rough edit to help you uh, to guide the process. But ultimately, it's up to you to block the characters do some breakdown poses, some, some key poses for the characters, and figure out where the cameras are going to go and how you're going to tell the story at that point in the movie. It's a really exciting and fun process, but it requires a kind of fluidity and a kind of sandbox mentality that is really difficult in animation. But thankfully, with Blender, it's becoming so accessible, so incredibly easy to play. And that's kind of the big focus of what we're going to talk about. It's how Blender enables you to engage in the sandbox of play. Because when you can engage in play when you're creating sequences, you know, you're set free. So tr traditionally, animation has been brutal. You know, it's, you have to commit to stuff. And if you, you know, make a change later on down the track, it's, it's painful to go back. You know, it's so difficult and expensive and prohibitive. 
And so when you're doing previs, you know, you really need to be able to, you know, whip stuff up quickly. You've got to put a whole sequence together, and then, then we pitch it to the director. And right now I get to pitch to this director that's like a, it's like a legend. He's a hero of mine, and um, one of those guys with a lot of little gold statues. Very intimidating to talk to. And you present your, your, your sequence, you know, and then, and then you, you hold your breath, and you get the feedback. And, and then you go back, and you re, retool your sequence, and you put it together. And so it's been really fun to use Blender at that level and to be able to present, um, present that kind of work um, at that, in that kind of environment. Now, with sequences, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, this short film that I've been making on YouTube. Now, one of the things that I've, I've always wanted to do, and I'm finally getting to do it, is to make a short film from beginning to end live on YouTube. So I've been um, created the story as a tutorial. I talked about how to write, write a story for a short film, and I broke down that process as a tutorial. And then, I, and then I started making all the assets, and, and everything's a tutorial. And you can actually go watch this. It's all free. It's all on YouTube. There's a playlist if you can hunt it down. And then what I started to do is animate the film and actually make the film in these live streams and in these uncut recordings. So like hour-long sessions where I'd sit down, pick up the scene, and just go for it. So the goal is when the film is all finished to have the entire thing documented. So you can watch, if you're you know, crazy enough to sit down for that long in front of YouTube, you can watch the entire process of making this tiny little short film. So I've tried to keep it really simple. So I'm going to use this as our uh, talking point, our case study today. Uh, to talk about these concepts, since I can't share anything about the film that I'm working on, um, but uh, you'll still get the idea. So here's um, a, uh, the first scene of the film, which is finally done. I'm, I'm halfway through the second scene, and then there's three scenes in the movie, so it'll be done hopefully early next year is my goal. I'm not in any rush to finish this, but let's have a look at this, and, and then we'll talk about the process. So if we could dim the lights again, and uh, we've got some audio. So just jump over and do that. So the first thing I ask when I'm approaching a sequence is, okay, what's the change in this scene and what's the point of view? It's like two of the most important things. There's always a narrative beat change. Sometimes there's two in a sequence, sometimes there's a few more. But you want to figure out what is going to change in the story. When you pin that down, you've got to ask the question, whose point of view do I need to put the audience in? Who does the audience need to be empathizing with? and relating to. Those two things inform all the choices you begin to make from that point forward as you sculpt the sequence. Now, what you can see here in the, uh, the short, so the, the point of view that I'm working on in this one is, oh, play, back, play, back, back, play, there, that's how it works. Okay, so, sorry, we don't need to watch this one. We'll get to this in a second. So the, the point of view of this sequence that you just watched is the little droid character, the tiny guy, you know, that kind of sneaks off and, and nips off. So I'm thinking about his point of view, and I'm thinking about the key change in this scene, which is the surprise of when the floor opens up underneath him and he, and he drops. So I want to make sure that I capture that beat. You'd be surprised how easy it is to miss the most important beat in your scene when you're putting something together. If you've made a short film or you've, you know, directed anything, you'll know that, like, it's, when you first do it, you often get in the edit room and you realize that you forgot to film the most important part of your sequence. So it's actually really important to sit down. I've done this so many times. I've completely missed what matters. So it's really important to make a note of it. Now, here's some, some basic ideas of how to build a good sequence. You want to always ask the question, where is your audience's eye? So your job as a filmmaker is to juggle the eye of your audience. You know, you're playing, you're, you're moving them around, you're keeping them engaged in the sequence. This is very important, especially in action, when, when things are going really fast. You want to know where your audience is looking. So right now I know in this shot, my audience is looking there at laser pointer, that guy, right? So I want to make sure that my next shot keeps the focal point, the most important thing, in the same spot on the frame. That means that there's no moment where the, the viewer has to search for what they're supposed to look for. And when you're cutting between shots, you know, it's really important that you keep that you know, consistent so they know where they're at and they don't get lost and they're able to just keep getting that information. So that's super important. Lens variety, another good tip. Change up the size of your lenses. So you start with a wide, you know, you go for like a, uh, you know, like a 14 millimeter or something and then you, you cut into something a bit closer. You do like a 25 or you know, and a 50 mil. 
And keeping that variety is really, really key. Um, it's okay if this one doesn't play, so don't, don't stress. The, um, so yeah, here you can see. So we're cutting in to a, a tighter lens, you know, and then, and then we cut in a bit wider, and we go to this POV, we're a different size lens, and then we're back to him. So keeping that variety, what that does is it helps your edit to feel a bit more organic, a bit more, um, you don't notice the edit as much. It feels more natural. It jumps, uh, you don't have jump cuts. Cuts don't, don't feel very um, harsh when you're changing up your lens size. Next thing is screen direction. This is, you know, filmmaking 101. You want to keep people in the, your, your subject matter in the, the same sides of the screen that they belong. So the, the red light here gets over on the, uh, the right of frame, and then he's over on the left, and he's looking at it. So I've established this is the direction. I want to keep him over here always now. I want to keep this over here always. So this lives in the right. This, this guy lives in the left. So if I cut to an over the shoulder of the light, you can see I've kept him in the left, and I've kept the light on the right. This keeps everybody oriented in the scene, so they don't get lost. If I cut to a reverse, he's still on the same side of the screen. So I'm keeping him there, and he's looking where the light lives. The light lives on the, the right side of the screen. So that consistency is really important, because if you break that, it gets really confusing. You go like, okay, so what's he looking like? And now it feels like he's turned his head in that, if you kind of feel that, that cut, it, it feels like he's changing his perspective, right? So that's, that's the effect, and you can lose your audience if everyone's looking in different places, and you're like, what is going on with this scene? I don't know. So that's how you can solve that. So screen direction is super important. And then finally, camera movement across cuts. So when, you're, when you've got a uh, camera move, so like a really nice dramatic um, you know, move, you, you want to make sure the next shot you go to is also moving. Okay? And then if that shot, you want to go to a shot that's still, you want to make sure that shot comes to a stop first. Okay? So bring it to a stop, and then you cut to another still shot. And if you want to make things move again, you can make that one start to move. And if you're still moving on your cut, you want to make sure your next shot is also moving like this across the stage, right? So that's really important. So keep the movement going. It's, it's one of those rules you can break, but it is a really good one to keep in mind. It uh, keeps things flowing well. Okay, so how do we actually make this stuff? How do you make a short film? How do you make a sequence? I always start with storyboards. Now, Paul did a great talk on storyboards. If you didn't catch that, I'd encourage you to watch it online on YouTube. It's up there. Um, so first step for me, whenever I'm doing these boards, I create a blank grease pencil object. I switch to draw mode. Very important. Don't forget that step. And then I turn on sync to audio. Oh my gosh, this is so important. If you forget to do this, it can really screw <laughs> I've done this so many times, I've forgotten to sync to audio. This will play at you know, 24 frames a second or whatever your, your FPS is consistently, even if your performance is bad on your computer and you start dropping frames. So make sure you do that. Then you get a sense of timing. And then what I do is I turn on auto king. Next step, very important, auto king. And because that does is whenever you draw a new frame on the, uh, in your space, it will you know, delete everything that's there, and it will create a fresh drawing for you. And so what you can do is you can squ quickly scrub through your timeline and draw. And you don't have to worry about like, managing if you delete everything first or whatever. You just draw, 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 and every drawing becomes a new frame. And then you've got these lovely keyframes on your dub sheet, and you can actually time your edit now. You can start to edit by just grabbing the summary keyframe, moving it around. And this is how I plan out a sequence. I, I'll draw it, and I'll create this full animatic. And I get, basically, when I'm done, I've got an edit of my movie. I've got an entire edit. I know exactly kind of how long I want each shot to go. I know basically what I want to have happen. You can see the, the film that you just watched. You know, it's all playing out. And you just move those keyframes. That's the same as moving your edit markers, OK? So this is very effective. So then um, I export this, and I bring it in as a reference. Um, now, I just wanted to give one little tiny workflow tip. There's been a lot of workflow stuff at the, the conference today, so I won't dwell on this. But um, one really great tip that I like for making collections clear when I'm working in a team and we need to link and append stuff in as you can see here, I've got this droid asset that I've made. And um, right up here, I've got this little double dash arrow thing. And that's just a, a sort of a, a token that my team and I, we, you know, we agree on. This is what means, this is, the, this is the collection to import, OK? So that way, if I've got like 100 of collections and thousands of setup things and I've dragged everything in it, I can make sure that the most important thing that someone needs to bring in is always going to be in the one with that little arrow. So that way, when they go to import, they go to append, they go to collection, and up oh, there it is. It's always going to pop up at the top, and it's always super clear which one is the correct one. So this is kind of a version control thing that I really like to do. It's simple, and it works. So I'd recommend doing that. All right, let's talk about the most exciting part, of, for me at least, the nonlinear filmmaking. This is so cool. Okay, I hope you guys think it's cool. What do I mean by nonlinear filmmaking? Okay, so you've got your storyboards. You're figuring out your sequence. You're creating cameras. You're positioning them in your scene. You've got your characters. What I do is I create a new camera, and then I'll look through that camera. I'll click the little you know, camera icon next to the name. Click. And then I'll come over and I'll Control-B to bind camera to marker. Right? So we've talked about that. You've heard that before. 
So this is how I would create an edit, right? I start to create all these different cameras for my shots. And you can grab those markers and move them around, you know, and you can begin to refine how the edit feels. You can go, okay, I like this close up or I like this wide, but I feel like it needs to be a little shorter. And so I can, you know, you move those markers around. You just keep playing, right? So you're creating this live edit. Now, of course, when you're, when you're making a film, you know, it's not like live TV, right? Where you can just animate all the action and then you can just cut to different cameras and stuff. It doesn't really work. You need to jump time. You need to have, uh, you know, weird cheats where your characters move. So you end up with a lot of keyframes. And on these cut points, right, that you've created with your camera, you tend to cheat stuff. Like you'll move the character over a bit for this particular shot and then you'll move it and it gets really messy. So you think, oh, I can't make any changes, but you can. What you do is you hit I on the dub sheet and you select all channels. And this will insert a keyframe for everything that already has a keyframe on it. So it's like you're kind of locking the position. And then you set it to free handles and that'll preserve your curves if you've done really careful curves. If you move these keyframes apart now, it won't break anything. Then you select all your cameras and you go and you can select all that's after the current frame. And then you make, on, make sure that sync markers is turned on. Sync markers is magic. I love this tool. If you hit G to grab, you'll move your keyframes and all those cameras will pop and stay in sync with those keyframes. So I've just created a gap here in my edit. I've gone, oh, you know, I'm gonna add 20 frames to this bit and I haven't wrecked anything. And then I'm scaling it. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna slow it all down. So I scale it and those markers just stay in sync with the keyframes. So suddenly it's like you're using a nonlinear editor to animate. It's incredible. Like, oh my gosh, who thought of this? Are they here? Can you put your hand up? I want to give you a hug after this talk. It's like the best thing ever. So being able to move your keys around like that mean you, means you never get in a situation where you're like, I really need six more frames at the end of this shot, but there is no way I can add it because, oh my gosh, the domino chain this is going to set off if I move this one thing. It's going to break everything and ruin my sequence. You don't have to worry about it anymore. As long as you hit I to set a key for all those channels, set them to free for the handle, and then you sync markers, you can move. Now make sure you turn sync markers off. It can really catch you out if you're not careful with that, uh, because if it's turned on and you like, grab one keyframe and you've got like 20 cameras selected and you don't realize it and you grab that one keyframe, all those cameras are gonna move with you. So that is a bit of a, yeah, so look out for that. But uh, if you can remember that much, it, it works out really, really well. But there's more that you can do with this, okay? So check this out. This next thing I'm gonna do, I've got a point in my sequence where I'm like, I really like this close-up, um, and I want to I wanna have this close-up earlier. I don't like it here in my sequence. So, you know, let's move it. So we, you know, set a keyframe for all the channels, just like I just showed. Go to the next cut point, keyframe for all channels. Then we select the keyframes. We will select them. Sometimes it's easier, too, to collapse everything. Um, it can be overwhelming to see all these, all these keyframes, so you can, like, just collapse down to the summary view. Um, I also make sure I've got only show selected turned off and show hidden always turned on. I've always keep those on. So here I am, I select the keys for that particular shot and I just shift D, duplicate, drag them back to that gap that we created earlier. And then I grab the camera marker, shift D, grab that and bring it back so that it's a cut point. And then I just bring the keyframes up so that those, the, that cut point that I created lines up with the, with the next one. And then what happens is suddenly it's like I'm able to cut to this completely different moment that I have animated way later in my film, I've now brought it up and it works. And it didn't break the animation before the animation after. And those curves are still just the way they were. And so what this does is it basically allows you to create shots with absolute freedom and you can grab and move them around. Now, some of the gotchas with this that you need to be aware of, I really recommend um, that you uh, don't use the NLA editor, don't use the nonlinear animation editor. If you do, bake your animation and then get it in your sequence. And the reason for that is um, NLA is great for like blending lots of different complex animation strips, but it's not accessible in your dope sheet. And so if you can bake it back out to keyframes, so you've got it in your dope sheet, it means that you can continue to work in, in this way. So that's kind of one catch. You really can't use the NLA if you're gonna be doing this. Um, but it's fine, I don't really miss the NLA um, in terms of a, a constant state. Like it's fine to bake stuff down for. Um, but pretty much everything other than that works really, really well. Um, and if you have a situation where you need to actually export individual shots, well, we'll get to that actually, but we'll talk about that. So let's talk about some other stuff. Um, I've got no idea how I'm doing for time. I should probably check that at some point. Uh, just excuse me, I'll just turn things. But yeah, we're fine. Okay, so instance lighting. So I like to light um, individual shots uniquely. Like I like to have a, I do kind of one big master light for my set. And then what I do, you know, I put all those lights in a collection and I give that collection name like master light setup or something. And then I create collections for every camera. And I take the name of the camera and I paste it into my collection so they match, so it's easy to see the difference. And then I start to do these custom light setups, right? So I, I light this specific shot. Now, once you've done that, one of the big problems is you end up with like hundreds of lights, right? 
and you have different lights for different shots, and you're cutting to those shots. And if you want to set a keyframe for all those lights to like turn them on or off, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of keyframes, and it's a pain, and it takes like 20 minutes just to, you know, first you key the viewport, pop, 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 and then you key the camera, pop, 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 and then you key the eye for some reason, you're like, I don't need to key the eye because I did the viewport, you know, but if you finally get it all done, it's a lot of work to manage. So um, the quicker way to do it is first set your cursor to world origin. This is important, because if you don't, what you're about to do it appears off wherever the cursor is. Then you want to turn on uh, Always Show Hidden, so you don't you know, lose the ones that are disappeared. And then you take one of your lighting collections for a shot, and you right-click on it, and you go Instance to Scene. And this will create an instance of that collection. And then you hide that collection with the lights, and then you go down to the instanced version, and you keyframe the visibility. Very easy. It's great. So now you've got a collection that is exactly the same, lights it in the same way, and you can turn it on and off with just one set of keyframes whenever you want for every shot. And then once it's in your dub sheet, you're now able to move it around with everything else in your nonlinear editor workflow, and you're able to light individual scenes, and it works really, really well. So um, if you want to do multiple takes, um, I recommend using scenes. So you can go up and create a multiple in a different scene and break it out. You can do a variation. This also works good if you want to export um, individual shots with handles, right? So if you don't want to be restricted by, you've got an edit that works really well, you export it from that, great. But then I also want to do a few of my shots with handles. You can break them out into a master scene. You can just uh, create either a link copy or a full copy and then delete all the markers off your timeline. You can even delete the cameras out of that and if it's a full copy. And, um, and just output you know, from the timeline the specific frames you want for you know, whatever that shot is so your editor can do more with it. Or in my case, in this short film, I am the editor, so I'm just keeping the edit in Blender in the timeline as I'm working, um, and that works really well. This is also important for a motion blur can be a problem on this because if you're doing it this format, you know, if you cut to a different shot and you've got your character over here and then suddenly he's over here because the framing's a bit better, you're going to get a weird motion blur frame. So that's where you would want to break these out and do the handles so you don't end up with those bizarre bizarre moments. Um, so all of that stuff together really works to make a really fluid, organic process, and it enables you to play. And that's probably the most important thing. And what I wanted to leave you guys with um, as a thought was, you know, very much in filmmaking, it's very similar to in life, right? You, you start out with a goal. You go, I want to make this film. And you got this idea, and you think it's a straight path. Just like in life, you know, yeah, I want this job, or I want to do this thing with Blender, it's going to be a straight path, right? Sure. Of course not. It's never a straight path. Filmmaking's never a straight path. It's a wandering, meandering path with, with double backs and, you know, splits and dead ends, and all this stuff happens. And you have to be willing to embrace that journey. And I think that we overemphasize finishing way too much. Starting is so much more important than finishing, because if you never start anything, you're never going to finish anything. And so I'd encourage you to, to get into Blender and play and get really good at starting things. Because if you can do that, then you're going to have that moment when you do finish something. And you need to create that opportunity and that space for yourself. So try not to discourage yourself from not finishing things and celebrate the starts that you do. And if you start things, like I've started this short film, and hopefully you'll finish it. And hopefully I'll finish this short film. And I really hope that you join me for the journey and you uh, come watch it with me over on YouTube as I do it. So check it out. Thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your conference. Catch me afterwards. Yeah.